In our fast-track race through life, problems trip us up. We stumble and fall. On today's program, I want to share with you how to fall into greatness. The words seem contradictory at first. Falling into greatness? How can any failure be an opportunity for growth and greatness? The secret I want to share with you is how to fall into the greatness of God. When we are caught by His everlasting arms, we discover His true greatness, and as a result, our own through Him. Come with me to the sanctuary. The Lord is waiting to turn our struggles into stepping stones. I have very exciting news for you. The Lord can heal our memories. He can set us free from the past so that we can befriend the future. That's the triumphant good news of the 145th Psalm. Hear the word of God. I will extol you, my God, my King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your work to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness, and I shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O God, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. And your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord upholds those who fall and raises up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them food in their season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him. Isn't that a magnificent message? Praise God for giving us a word like that so that we can know that we can close the door on the past and begin a new future. Let's pray about that. Oh, gracious God, we love you because you have first loved us. Our hearts are filled with your love, and suddenly we realize that we are free to love ourselves in spite of all of our failures, the goofs of life, all of our stumblings, trippings, and fallings. And Lord, out of that comes a new tenderness toward other people. We long to have you invade our memories and heal us so that we can be free. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so profoundly and giving us a new beginning. All praise and glory and honor be to you. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Hallelujah and amen. I have a wonderful friend who was a high flyer in the circus when he was a boy. He told me a remarkable thing about how he learned to be a confident high flyer. 
He said, Lloyd, you've got to learn how to fall. I said, what? He said, yes. Only after repeated falls and the knowledge that the net will catch you can you be courageous up on the trapeze. He said, after I fell over and over again and the net caught me, I knew that I didn't need to worry anymore. I could move from one trapeze to the other with comfort and joy because I knew that if something went wrong, the net was right there to catch me. And then he said, the only thing that can hurt you when you fall into the net is if you stiffen up. And when you do, the rope stings on your body. But the rope really is your friend if you allow it to be. As he said that to me, I suddenly realized that that's the secret of how to live adventuresomely. We all know times of failure as we move from one event to another, as the trapeze artist moves from one trapeze to the other. Often we miss and we fall. And it's only when we realize that underneath are the everlasting arms that we can continue to live without fear of failure. See, the difficulty with most of us is that once we fail, we remember the failure, and that's put into the tissues of our memory. And we think more about the failure than we think about God's power. And as a result, we become the failure. Our capacity of imagination pictures ourselves as the failure rather than the person that God wants us to be. I remember when I was a radio announcer in college, I read some copy uh, of a commercial in the middle of a newscast, and it was by a fish restaurant, and there was the word ichthyophagist, which means a lover of fish. Well, I didn't uh, know that word. I came upon it, and... I said, ichthy, ichthy, uh, ichthyophagist. I finally got it out. But once I had fluffed, as they call it in the radio business, my mind was more on the mistake than on the rest of the 15 minutes in the program. And because my mind was focused on that failure, I fluffed, made mistakes, all through the rest of the program. Life is like that. The discovery of how to fail successfully is one of the most important discoveries that we'll ever make. We all know failures, but what we do with them makes all the difference in the world. How can we discover what my high-flying friend discovered, that there is a net to catch us, that the Lord will uphold us? This past summer, when I was walking in the highlands, I came across a man and his little son. The little son had a kilt on, and he loved his daddy. You could tell that by the way he grasped a hold of his daddy's hand. And he'd climb up on a big stone fence, and his daddy would stand beneath him, and then he would say, Daddy, if I jump, will you catch me? And his daddy would say, Why, of course, son. My arms are strong. Just jump and I'll catch you. And the little boy would totter and then wonder whether he could dare to trust his daddy's arms. And then with one confident leap, he would let go and drop into his father's arms. And I will never forget it as long as I live the look on that little boy's face as he cuddled in his father's strong arms and put his head close to his daddy's head. And he said, oh, daddy, your arms are so strong. And they were. He could trust his daddy to catch him. Now that's the confidence that the psalmist came to in his relationship with the Lord. In the 145th Psalm, the psalmist extols the greatness of God, his greatness in creation, providential care of his people, in his righteous forgiveness and acceptance of his people and of his ability to sustain them 
regardless of their failure and sin. And then, in one triumphant moment in the psalm, he declares the truth. The Lord upholds those who fall and lifts up those who are bowed down. It's a dual image of those who fall, the Lord lifting them up, of those who are bowed down by life's pressures, of the Lord bringing them back to an erect, straight resoluteness. And it's all because of his love. The psalmist had learned in repeated failures that in those times, the Lord would not leave him nor forsake him. The Lord was faithful. That's the good news for you and me right now. You're probably dealing with some failures. We all fail. We all fall. We stumble in life. And that's human. But what we do with them is what makes us unique. A Christian is not superior in that he knows more, has memorized more, and can arrogantly tell everyone what they ought to do and be. A Christian is a person who knows that the Lord is able to take the worst that happens and make out of it the best. And I want to tell you, that's the good news this tired, frustrated, sick old world needs more than anything else. Not people who have succeeded in everything, for who has? But people who have failed and have allowed the Lord to use those failures for new beginnings. You see, the psalmist discovered three triumphant things about God that led him to be able to say that the Lord is consistent in being able to uphold those who fall and lifting up those who are bowed down. And those three things are as follows. The psalmist had come to know of the nature of God, the nearness of God, and the newness of God. Let's consider those three things together. The nature of God, says the psalmist, is his righteousness. Now, when you talk about righteousness, that's the center of the center, the essence of the essence. You get right to the core of God. Righteousness is another way of saying that's what God is in and of himself. See, God is the source of all things. He's the uncreated creator, the unmoved mover, the source of all that exists. And his essential nature is love, gracious kindness, forgiveness, and care. And his righteousness describes that inner heart of his heart. The righteousness of God created a people to be his people, and he described to us how he wanted us to live with him and with one another, and he gave us the Ten Commandments. Well, you know what we all did with those. The very fact that the Lord said, this is the way I want you to live. In our own rebellion, we tried to do the things that we wanted to do on our own strength, and many of us can't even get past the first commandment to have no other gods before him. And all of the other things that we do, enumerated in the other commandments, are really a result of the fact that we have become the God of our own life, and we're running the show. But what do you do when you fail? God, in his yearning heart, reached out to his people. The psalmist uses a magnificent word, chesed, which means giving and forgiving love. In the New Testament, the word is grace. It means that it's unqualified love that's never held back dependent upon the adequacy or the performance of the recipient. It's love that cannot help but act. It is love that reaches out, love that grasps out for the one who needs it most. That's the nature of God. He's the net, the daddy's arms. He catches us when we fall. But look at the nearness of God. The Lord is near to those who fear him, said the psalmist. 
Now, fear in Hebrew is not what we mean of fear of being afraid of something. It's awe and wonder. The awe of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a sense of his holiness, his wonder and his power brings us to our knees. And we say, holy, 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 holy is the Lord. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Glory be to you, O Lord Most High. And that sense makes us realize our own deep inner needs for him. And then when we open our lives to him, he comes and he takes everything in our life the failures and the successes, and maximizes them. You see, when we fall into greatness, the wonder is that we discover aspects of God's nature that we could never have known before. Now, let me illustrate that. If you walk down a country road and the sky is blue and the sun is bright and the trees are beautiful with blossoms, the flowers are magnificent, you can know that behind this universe is a God of power who has created all things with a plan and a purpose. But if along that road you remember your failure in the past and you realize that you're afraid of the future because you might repeat that failure, it's at that point that you discover something more than the grandeur of God's greatness in his creation you recognize his greatness in the power of forgiveness. You see, it's in the cross of Jesus Christ that God revealed his true greatness and gave us the capacity to realize his greatness. And so we say what we have often sung, Father, look upon his anointed face. Look not upon our sin. Look not upon our misusing of your grace, our prayers so languid, our faith so dim. For lo, between our sin and their reward, we place the passion of thy Son, our Lord. And that brings us to the newness of God. He's more concerned about the future than the past. And it isn't until we get those memories healed and washed out that we become free to know that he is able to be with us each day. That's what Jude discovered when he said, now to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his glory with exceeding joy. Now, that isn't just what he does when we die when he comes with us and stands with us and presents us faultless before God. Jesus Christ is with us right now, and this day can be the first day of a new beginning when we realize Jesus Christ coming beside us and then coming into us and filling us with his power. And we know that right now, in Jesus Christ, we stand as righteous before the living God. The past is gone and the future is alive with triumphant new beginnings. And so we say with Saul Cain in John Macefield's Everlasting Mercy, the prison door had broken in and I knew that I was done with sin. The Lord had given me birth to brother all the souls on earth. And then with Louisa Tarkington, oh, how I wish there were some wonderful place called the land of beginning again, where all our mistakes and all our heartaches and all our poor selfish grief could be taken off like a shabby old coat and left at the door and never put on again. Right now, we have the opportunity to begin again. We can fall into greatness. And the amazing thing is, 
will fall less in the future. The knowledge of his love in our failures frees us from the fear of failure.